Jack, come on. You all right? You take a wimp? What is it? What is it? What are we doing today? Today, Marshall and I are at UK Bike Fit and we're gonna be doing a fit on my Cervelo R5, which has had a few changes since the Everest. So I've not ridden it since the Everest, but basically it's now on 12 speed Ultegra Di2. We put the reserve wheels on it. And I think it's really important to go and refresh and refine your bike fit like once a year. So we're just gonna check my road fit on it as well. And hopefully there won't be too many changes, but you literally never know. Oh, we've got a bike. It's making me want to get a bike fit dog. We've got a load of people ask questions to ask Dan. So we're gonna run through some of those questions and uh, give some bike fitting answer tip things, please. He keeps the camera on me for so long and I feel really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about bike fits? Do you wanna give us a professional opinion? <laughs> well, basically, I, we both did a post on Instagram asking for people to give uh, any questions they wanted to ask Dan, bike fit related questions. Uh, and we now are gonna sort of run through those kind of questions with this very fetching, Cervelo, expensive, expensive, carbon fiber, SP24 seat post microphone. It's the most aero mic we've ever, we've ever had. Is it ASMR? <laughs> <laughs> So we got a, a, quite a large variety of questions and we sort of filtered through to the ones that we think are, I guess, the most useful. So the first one is, what are your thoughts on cleats back, all the way back? It's come from like a gener generic advice thing. So if you're giving advice to someone or a group of people without being individual about it, telling them to run their cleats back is like a safe thing to do. If you run your cleats too far forward, that will, in general, cause a lot more problems than running them too far, too far back. So if you're giving internet advice or, or uh, YouTube advice, then telling them to put them really far back is, is sort of the best you can do. But obviously in reality, having a bit more of an individual cleat position is better yeah. based on your own biomechanics and your own feet and your own shoe. Um, but also, shoe manufacturers tend to drill their bolt holes quite far forward. So Again, most people end up with a rearward position because of where the bolt holes are drilled, not because of any sort of other benefit. It's just physically you have to move them back on the on the shoe because that's where your feet sits in the shoe. Yes. It's the first time I've been on a bike since Morocco. sticking some Velcro on your body. The real answer is we're marking up various anatomical points that we want to see on the camera. So when we measure them, or when we see on the camera, we can use them to measure from. So this is genuinely the first time since Morocco you've pedaled? Yeah, first time since Morocco that I've pedaled. When I'm on the turbo, he sits there and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> What type of ride you're doing on this bike then? This will be the bike that if I go like on a trip to Spain with my mates, this will probably be the bike that I choose to take. Yeah. Dan's take on handlebar drops. Yeah, this was the weird one. Like, I didn't think people cared about handlebar drop as much as, or noticed handlebar drop as much as they obviously do. So the handlebar drop is the distance basically between the uh, top of the horizontal of the bar and then to the horizontal of the drop. And it's that distance between the two. So if you want a bigger disparity between your drop position and your hood position, a bigger drop is better. Maybe you want like quite a relaxed, upright hood position, uh, body position when you're on the hoods, but then when you want to get low, you want to get low. So having a bigger drop's good. Um, having a shallower drop is obviously the opposite. Also, like it's physically quicker to get your hands from the hoods to the drops if you've got a, a shallower drop measurement. So some people like that because you're not, you're off, you're not off the bars for as, for as long. But that's basically it. There's not really, too much other reason why you'd want a different handlebar drop. So I'm going to chuck in there as well, what about flared bars? Mm -hmm. What do you think of flared bars? So if you're doing a lot of technical descents, maybe you want a wider hand position on the drops so that you can descend with a bit more confidence and control. You see them in a lot of gravel races, part of that is to get a bar bag in between the uh, yeah, yeah. In, in between the bars. Yeah, it feels like now there's, 
I, I think of Pro as an example because I've, I've used a lot of their products. Mm. They must do in the various different handlebars of aluminium and carbon, there's probably five or six or seven different widths mm. plus different variations of the drops, plus aero bars, lightweight bars. There's so many options now from one brand and you think there's probably there's hundreds of different brands to go through, isn't there? Yeah. You're not struggling for, for bar shapes now. The saddle needs to go up a fair bit, but then as you go up, the saddle's going back. back. Yeah. And it's already kind of okay in terms of setback, so we're going to need the post to get you further forward instead of running the saddle right on the edge of the rails. Makes sense. Well, it's good job I bought a spare in line place, right? I think I have to use my pick. Oh, I just used my finger. Seat posts are something that no one has nailed the design of ever. Saddle clamps, more correctly, yeah. Or there was way too much bend in Chris's knee at the bottom of his pedal stroke. You're stopping short of like what your legs got to give basically. So saddle's gone up, up, up quite a lot, but forward, so those two sort of counteract each other a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you're more over the bike, legs extending further, so the pedal stroke is more smooth through the bottom. How to tell a good bike fitter. Are you a good bike fitter? How do you tell? <laughs> Google reviews? Google reviews is a good place to start. And social media. If people have taken the time out of their day to write you a, a good review and then post it online, then that's that means means something. I saw a stat where there's more bike fitters in the UK than the rest of Europe put together. Yeah. So wow. there's a lot of choice. First thing I would look for is qualification. Like, how do you know if that person who calls themselves a bike fitter is is more qualified than that person? So I definitely look for look for some sort of qualification. Bike fitters tend to come into bike fitting from like two different angles. So one from the cycling side. So you'll see like a, a lot of maybe ex-pro cyclists or semi-pro cyclists then turn their attention to bike fitting as a career. And then the other direction is either through from the medical side. So. Um, lots of physios, time and physiotherapists, lots of physios turn to, to bike fitting. Although I'd probably say there's not as many physio bike fitters than there should be. Like physios are quite well placed for bike fitting, but also you have to do three years at university to be a physio. So you've, you've got that biomechanics knowledge. So qualifications is one, Google reviews, social media reviews is two, but also like chat to your cycling club mates or just cycling mates. Like talking to the people around you is, is probably a good thing, like word of mouth. Hmm. Is a, is a good way to, to, to know if you're seeing a good bike fitter because word of mouth works both ways. Like if someone's had a bad experience, they'll tell you. Another thing to like consider is technology. Do they use current technology? Are they still using plumb bobs and tape measures a lot of the time? Or are they using like video capture and or some sort of bike fitting software? There's loads of those around as well now. And also the there is an organization called the IBFI, International Bike Fitting Institute or Bike Fitters Institute. If a bike fitter has got an IBFI qualification, then they've taken some time to develop themselves, go through the process to get a qualification, which you, you've got to do a certain amount of fits and do a certain amount of courses and spend so much time developing yourself. So if you're on the IBFI list of bike fitters, then you've at least done some sort of You've invested um, time into it. You've invested time mm -hmm. and money into it as well. So um, that's a good place to start. That position where your hands a little bit further, like closer to your shoulders, just gives you a bit more control, a bit yeah. more relaxed through the back. So there's, there's, there's nothing to change around here. Well, that's easy to fit them, isn't it? Yeah. That sort of looked after itself because of that. Yeah. So like normally within a full fit, we'd be looking at things like basically looking at Chris's body a little bit more. So flexibility, core strength, biomechanics, how he moves off the bike, um, like what his physiology is like. So we've done that a million times with Chris because this is like the fifth bike I think we've seen. So we've, we sort of know where he's, uh, we know where he's at and we've got measurements to work from before from other bikes. So in terms of what we're doing with this bike, it's basically just refining it so that, like Chris has just had a new group set put on. So making sure that everything's back to where it should be. Um, and refining it so that it's right for what he's going to use it for, which is long days in the peaks, like social rides basically. So what we found was the saddle was a bit too low uh, and a bit too far back. So we've changed the seat post to an inline post to bring him further forward, raise the saddle height, so he's a little bit more over the bottom bracket, his knee position's better over the, over the bike as a whole, and his weight distribution's for what it needs to be. And then because we've come forward with the saddle, He's now got an overall shorter position with his body, which is good for what he's going to be using it for. This bike has previously been used for doing silly things, 
like the Everests, where riding uphill was basically what I was doing on it. So actually, the fit on it at the time was probably more tailored towards that, I would say. And now that I'm almost retiring the bike from stupid stuff and just using it to actually really enjoy riding it and taking it out for rides. So I wanted to make sure that it was comfortable, something that I could ride all day and not really worry or question it, which is going to be a stark contrast to this thing. Bling bling purple boy. How do you find the perfect saddle? And I think there was a caveat to this is not only how do you find the perfect saddle, but where are good places to try a variety of saddles as well? well that's a hard question because there isn't that many places to try saddles before you stump up X amount of pounds, usually three figures now. How do you find the perfect saddle? Or like, how do you know if you're on a good saddle as well is, um, is a question. Because a lot of people will just ride either what came with the bike or what they're used to and because they're unable to try different saddles or have any sort of objective feedback as to whether they're on a good saddle or not before they buy it, they'll never know whether they've got the best saddle possible or not. Your saddle should depend on your riding position, so you should match your saddle to your riding position, not the other way around. If your saddle's uncomfortable in your your natural riding position, you're on the wrong saddle, you shouldn't change how you ride to get better saddle comfort. The way that we test saddles here is through pressure mapping, but that gives you some objective data and it allows us to test saddles and gives us, it, we can see exactly how you're sat on the saddle. Mm -hmm. So we can see how your pelvis is contacting, where it's contacting, whether there's any soft tissue pressure, are you sitting on the correct part of the saddle or is the saddle putting you in a different position? We can see all that within 10, 15 seconds of pressure mapping, which is something that you will never know if you just sit and ride a saddle for 10-15 seconds outdoors. So a lot of bike fitters also will have a load of test saddles. Yep. Which, there's a wall off there. They normally come in really leery colours, so you don't nick them. Don't keep them. But that's also quite a good way of being able to try something before you buy it, right? Yeah, test saddle's good. It, it doesn't, you know, like most bike fitters will have access to that. If you go into a bike shop, then they're probably not going to have test saddles or that many test saddles. They might let you sit on them for a bit, but again, how do you tell? You can sit on any saddle for five minutes and it's perfectly fine. We're fitting this one because I've never had a fit on it. So Dan's got so much history and information of various bikes. I wanted to just get this one double checked, make sure it's right, make sure it's kind of comfortable. I'm a huge believer that you should have a fit on every bike or at least have the data for your fit and then be able to transfer it across. I think it's also really important to get the fit transferred by a fitter because everyone measures things slightly differently. So you want the person who's done the fit to be able to interpret their measurements correctly to the bike. How important are custom insoles? Yes. I liked this question yeah. because the feet in general is the most important part of the fit, genuinely. So not just insoles, but shoes, cleat position, um, how the ankle moves, stance width, cue factor, everything that's going on at the feet is, is the key to everything else above it. That's your base of support. That's your structure in which you're putting out power into the bike. So yeah. Feet in general are really important. So going on from that, I think custom insoles are more important because of what you get in a, in a standard cycling shoe. So in standard shoes, any shoe, no matter whether you're paying 50 pounds or 450 pounds, you will get a little bit of foam probably. Or for most people you'll need or want something more, um, whether that's for comfort, power, efficiency, whatever. A custom insole in particular, just make sure that that insole that you've got fits your foot. Like there's nothing more to it than that. Um, when they've done some research into insoles and like how they work, the important thing is that you've got contact with the foot. It's the contact with the foot that gives you that proprioception and that sensory input so your body can know where the foot is in, its, in space, know where the foot is in the shoe and give you that contact to press into to produce power. As long as you've got that contact, not a lot else about the insole matters, but obviously having a custom insole gives you that full amount of contact that you can possibly get. Um, an off-the-shelf insole is, a, is exactly that. So it's, a, it's the same insole for lots and lots of people's feet, so it's not going to be perfect for everybody. Um, whereas if you've got a custom insole, it just gives you that peace of mind that you've, 
you're getting the most out of that foot support as possible. So that was going to go up, same, same issue but to not as much of an extent as the other bike. So saddle's a bit too low, knees set back is good, yeah. so you're in a good position over the bottom bracket. <coughs> but um, yeah, just want to nudge it a little bit higher. Alright mate, stop there. Oh, the other thing that we've already done with Chris is feet, shoes, cleats, all of that jazz. Which in a normal fit would take a lot of time and that's quite an important part of the fit. <laughs> that is a shoe, in case you didn't know. Special insoles, <laughs> special feet. For a special boy. Is it worth having a fit on a road uh, bike or a mountain bike? This person said, I, I, I've got a mountain bike and a road bike. Should I have a fit on one or the other? Was yeah. I think it was what they, how they worded it. One should I have a fit on because I spend an equal amount of time on both. Yeah, yeah. I, li I like this question because it probably highlights a, a question that I get asked a lot or something that crops up a lot in bike fits is like my bike's only X amount of pounds. It's only worth this amount. I don't need or I shouldn't get a bike fit until I've got a more expensive bike. The bike doesn't matter. The, a bike fit is not about the bike. It's about you and the body and how you move and how you pedal. Whether you're on a 200 pound Halberd's bike or a 12 grand Pinarello literally does not matter. The bike fit is still giving you the same amount of value. So regardless of, of bike, then a fit is still beneficial. If we're talking about like multiple different road bikes, depending on the ge geometry, you can transfer the measurements to some extent. But when you're talking about different body positions and riding positions, a road bike versus a mountain bike, very different, you can't transfer the measurements. So you need a fit basically on every bike that you're gonna have a different riding position in. With this bike, the main goal of it was just to, as I said, just to check the fit on it again. An example ride I would go on this bike would be if I was in London and I was meeting up with a bunch of mates and we were gonna go and ride in Richmond Park, this is the bike I would take because it's a ride that everyone goes and just takes pieces out of each other. The kind of goal was just to make sure the position was kind of right and it, the same as every other bike. Same thing as I've said earlier about saddle heights. Everyone measures it differently and we've subsequently found that. that this saddle was considerably lower as well. Yeah. But in terms of the front end, we're probably not going to change much of it. We are at a later date going to do a video with my Chrome Edward Boston Hagen's S5 where we're going to see how aero we can get that one because it's the bike I use for road bike time trials. It's already pretty aero, fast. So we can optimize it. We can optimize the hell out of that one. What would be an alternative solution to a leg length discrepancy? This person was asking about cleat shims mm -hmm. for leg length and is there an alternative? There is an alternative, volume reducers to put in your shoes. Uh, these are from form. These um, obviously go inside the shoe under your insole to reduce the volume in your shoe. So they only work if you've got volume to spare in your shoe. Yeah. If you are already pretty tight on volume, you would not want to use these, you would just want to use a cleat shim. But yeah, in theory, you could use one of these in the shoe to give you, uh, these are two mil, you can get one and three mil versions as well, but you can use these in the shoe to give you a one foot higher stack mm -hmm. than the other, which would potentially accommodate for a leg length difference. If you happen to have a leg length discrepancy and want to reduce volume in your shoe, this could be like a one, one piece solution. Yeah. But really, if you don't want to affect how your shoe fits, you need a shim under your cleat. What does, what does that even say? Okay, I'll give you some slack on this one. I wrote transferring measurements between bikes, but then the question was actually how to transfer measurements between bikes. There are certain measurements from your fit, from your riding position, that you can transfer to another bike. But you do have to be care careful of all the other variables like pedal type, shoe, cleat type, saddle type. Have you got exactly the same saddle? Group set, which is another one a lot of people don't think about, but the shifter type and the shifter size will have an effect on your reach, which the majority of the measurements from fit won't take into account. If you want a ballpark position on another bike, let's say you've, you've had a bike fit on a bike and you buy a new bike and you just want a position that you can just go off and ride in, transfer the measurements and you'll be there or thereabouts. If you want to make that really specific and make sure that you are in the, exactly the same body position, then you'd need a fit on the bike. I use four different measurements. Everyone does this differently and there's loads of different ways. There's no, no right or wrong. 
but I use four different measurements um, in, in this order as well. That's probably an important point. If you do this in a different order, um, you'll end up with a different outcome. You want to set the back end of the bike first and then have the front end of the bike positioned to that. So yeah, saddle height, top of the saddle to the center of the back bracket. Make sure you take into account crank length, pedal stack for that. Then saddle setback, which is tip of the saddle to a vertical of the bottom bracket. Your saddle will change that measurement. So if you change saddles or you're measuring a bike with a different saddle, you will not get this exact measurement. So once you've got those two measurements, that is basically your seating position in relation to your pedal stroke. So you're halfway there. Then I would measure the fit reach, which again is from the tip of the saddle. So tip of the saddle to a diagonal measurement I do to the back of the grip, because that will take into account differences in group set. So again, if you, as long as you've got the same saddle, you're measuring from the tip to the back of the grip, that is the, the distance in which you're reaching to the bars. So that's that. And then the last one I take is the saddle to bar drop, which is a horizontal of the saddle to a horizontal of the bar, and then the difference between the two. If you're measuring that at home, it's easier to take. Make sure the bike's level, tip of the saddle to the floor, center of the bar to the floor, and then take the difference. Obviously that'll give you a drop. If you've got those four measurements in that order, and you're pretty close, then, then you'll be in a good starting position. The thing that will really cock, up, cock it up is the geometry differences in bikes. So if your bike is a different geometry to another bike, you might be able to get these measurements close, but not exact because, I don't know, the stack height of the frame is a lot lower or a lot higher. So you just can't get that drop right. But if you can get everything else okay, then, then you're, you're in a good spot. We covered it all now. Long and short of it, I think the answer to most of these questions are is the best thing to do is to reach out to an expert that's local to you, do some research by asking your friends and people in your surrounding area, look at reviews online and basically get a bike fit. If this is useful, let us know in the comments because we can very easily do videos on specific topics and subjects and, you know, full, long, hour-long discussions about deep, things. We could do a deep dive episodes into one specific area of bike fit if you want but it's like how nerdy do you want to get with it how much detail do you want to get let us know people normally want to get quite nerdy thank you for watching this video like yeah. comment subscribe see you on the next one